In the early 1990s, George Russell Jr. was an affable fixture in the laid-back nightclubs of Bellevue. Those who met him thought George was a charming guy with a big, friendly smile who liked to treat his friends with a round of drinks. But if you happen to get to know George a little bit better, you learn that he was actually quite emotionless. He felt no guilt and was obsessed with sex, which was pretty problematic because George did not handle rejection well. Not well at all. Eventually, his growing hostility toward women exploded in the worst possible way. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe, I'm the host, and thank you for joining today. And some of you have asked, where did the disclaimer at the beginning of the uh, all the episodes go? Where did it go? You haven't been using that. And to be honest with you, I got rid of it to save a little bit of time to get to the story a little quicker, and because I thought that the disclaimer should be implied in the name of the podcast. It's about murders. If you don't want to hear about murders, then you obviously are in the wrong place. Plus, I don't like them anyway. I think they sound too legal, like you're trying to get one over on the system. Maybe you're on the borderline of doing something you shouldn't be doing. I've done the voiceover for literally hundreds, maybe thousands of different commercials for different clients around the country and around the world. And anytime there's a disclaimer in there, I always feel like, oof, I don't want to say this. And two of them in particular, uh, car dealerships where they have that speed reading disclaimer, that always to me is like a red flag. They're trying to get something over on you. They're trying to slip something by you and that you don't understand. And then there are the lawyer commercials and their disclaimer, you don't have to say it fast, but it's... No representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers. That's their disclaimer. They legally have to tell you for some reason that they are not saying that they are better than other lawyers. What? I want to hire a lawyer that solely is saying I'm better than all the other lawyers. Come choose me. But you can't say that. I don't know. It's weird. Anyway, that's a long story for telling you why I got rid of the disclaimer. I may bring it back. I don't. But there's your answer. But for old time's sake, listener discretion is advised. Now, if you are brand new to this podcast, first of all, I am super glad you're here and you have no idea what I'm talking about. If you go back and listen to some of the previous episodes, you'll hear the disclaimer at the beginning. And if you are brand new, thank you for joining and I hope you become a subscriber. And becoming a subscriber means that you won't miss any future episodes of 10 Minute Murder. You can also connect with 10 Minute Murder on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those places. The links are in the show notes of this episode. Now, let's get to today's story. On June 23, 1990, a McDonald's employee in Bellevue, Washington, was going through his morning routine just like any other day. Inside the restaurant, Nothing was out of the ordinary, but as he walked outside to the dumpster area, the employee saw something that likely burned into his mind forever. A woman, nude, was lying on the ground, one ankle over the other and hands folded on her chest. There were many more strange details at the scene, but obviously the McDonald's employee did not stick around to take a closer look. The police arrived soon after and they immediately noticed that the woman's body had not just been thrown there. Somebody had used quite some time to stage the scene. They had positioned the woman's limbs on purpose, put a pine cone in her hand, and a Frito-Lay dip container lid over her right eye and forehead. If there was some implied deeper meaning to all of this, the detectives didn't have a clue. The victim was identified as 27-year-old Mary Ann Polreich. An autopsy showed that she had likely died of manual strangulation, even though she had a number of other injuries that could have been fatal as well. Mary's skull was fractured and she'd been kicked so hard that it ruptured her liver. But what really alarmed the detectives was the anal tears that had occurred after Mary's death. The killer had raped her with an object post-mortem. Seven weeks later, the Bellevue Police Department was still at the beginning of the investigation when another body was found just two miles from that McDonald's. On the morning of August 9th, 13-year-old Kelly Beath noticed that her mother's car was still in the driveway which was not normal at all. So Kelly went to go knock on her mom's bedroom door, 35-year-old Carol. But there was no answer, and the door was locked. 
For a while, Kelly sat on the living room couch watching TV. But in the end, the situation was way too strange. So she got up, went outside to open the sliding glass door to her mother's room, and Carol indeed had not left for work that day. Instead, Carol laid naked on the bed. Her feet were together, but her legs were spread and her knees were bent. There was smeared blood on her legs, and for whatever sick reason, a rifle was placed between her legs, inserted five to six inches inside her. In addition, Carol's head was wrapped in a plastic bag and covered with a pillow, which was fortunate for Kelly, who didn't have to see her mother's crushed head. The other details alone were surely traumatizing enough. The head injuries were what had killed Carol, but the medical examiner stated that she also had broken ribs and a ruptured liver. It was pretty clear now that the killer wanted to shock whoever found the bodies, and he wasn't done yet. Just a couple weeks later, on August 31st in Kirkland, Washington, just five miles from Bellevue, another woman was killed in a similar way. 24-year-old Andrea Randy Levine was found dead in her bed. She laid on her back, head turned toward the left shoulder. Randy's straight legs were spread, and she had the book More Joy of Sex under her left forearm. A plastic sex toy was inserted into her mouth. Randy had also died of severe head injuries inflicted by an iron bar or a similar object. During an autopsy, it was noticed that Randy had been wearing a ring prior to her death, but it was now missing. So if the police found the ring, they found the killer. At this point, it was obvious the authorities were dealing with a serial killer who was killing very frequently. Fortunately, the next time would only remain as an attempt. On September 12th, Robin Oldenburg was packing for a trip at her home in Bellevue when she heard a weird knocking sound. There was something in that sound that made Robin feel uneasy, and it didn't stop. She followed her gut and called the police. When the police arrived, they found the screen from Robin's door missing. Somebody had tried to break into her home. That man had actually been driving away when an officer responded to Robin's call. It was 32-year-old George Russell. George already had a warrant for his arrest, apparently for impersonating a police officer, so he was taken into custody then and there. When Robin heard about the arrest, she was kind of shocked. She knew George. Robin had thought, quote, he was a fun, happy-go-lucky, great guy. George Russell was known as a charming reprobate, or a carefree guy. But now it seems more like he had a way darker side. When detectives questioned George, he denied everything and refused to hand over a DNA sample. So as they didn't have any physical evidence to link George to the murders, the investigators continued their search. Soon they were able to find a witness who had seen George coming out of a nightclub the night Mary died. She had been partying at the same club. The police then tracked down the friend who said George had used his truck that night to take a girl home. When he returned it, the vehicle smelled like blood. The test later confirmed that that blood indeed belonged to Mary Polreich. And before you ask, I'm assuming that blood smells like it tastes, like pennies or copper, something like that. I'm assuming because I've never smelled a bunch of blood before. I've tasted it. Not that I'm a vampire, but you know, you bust your lip and you can taste the blood. Anyway, despite all the evidence against him, George pleaded innocent to all charges. During a telephone interview with Seattle Media, George claimed that all the evidence was just circumstantial and that he had alibis. He also said, quote, Supposedly, I'm a Ted Bundy fan. I had books on him, but as far as a fan, no. Fan or not, George seemed to have taken a little too much inspiration from Ted Bundy. In the end, George Russell was found guilty of three murders on October 18, 1991. He was sentenced to two life sentences plus an additional 29 years in prison. That's today's 10-minute murder. Brief and bingeable true crime. Thank you for listening today, and now you know why I brought up the disclaimer at the beginning. I wanted to emphasize that this one was going to be bad. This one had some details in it that... There was no sugarcoating it. I couldn't get around saying some of the things that I needed to say in the episode to tell you exactly what happened and do it in a nice way. I mean, murder's not nice, but usually I can find a way to say it without saying it so graphically. This time I couldn't do that. Make sure before you go that you are subscribed to 10 Minute Murder wherever you're listening right now. Take a look at it and make sure that you are subscribed. You won't miss any future episodes if you become a subscriber. It's absolutely free, costs you $0, and you can also connect with 10-Minute Murder on social media. 
Links for that are in the episode notes, but it's just as easy to go to any of the social media places you want to follow 10 Minute Murder. Type 10 Minute Murder into the search bar and it'll pop right up. If you have friends, family, coworker, anyone that you are acquainted with and you think that they could be into brief true crime stories like this, make sure they know about 10 Minute Murder. Thank you for listening. Be safe and make good choices.